Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Midday Live on TV3 with me, Martin Isidu Dati. Coming up within the next one hour. Pupils from at least 28 schools in Togo secretly write the BECE in Ghana without accreditation. We have exclusive details coming up shortly. Also, Australia becomes the third country to issue threat alerts on Ghana to its citizens. And on the international front, United Nations peacekeeping mission in Mali sends aerial support to areas where nearly 100 people were killed so as to prevent a new attack. We have details of all these stories and more. Do get interactive with us on our various social media platforms. My uh, Twitter handle is at Newsy Martin. Do get interactive. We'll be happy to read your stories. Let's start from the House of Parliament. Clearly, 49.5% of eligible voters across the country say they will not vote to retain their members of parliament in the 2020 elections. That's according to a joint research by the University of Ghana's Political Science Department and the Conrad Adeno Foundation. Kwasi Afreniyama has more in the following report. The research, which was conducted from March to part of June 2019, saw the research team interviewing 100 respondents from each of the 275 constituencies. Now, to break it down further, they did this on an electoral area basis with latest data from the Electoral Commission. They had 20 respondents in five electoral areas per constituency, and they focused mainly on the role of MPs in their constituencies. Although the primary duty of MPs is to make laws, lead researcher Dr. Isaac Ousumensa revealed that most constituents are more interested in seeing their MPs undertake developmental projects. We are told that MP is supposed to be an advocate for development. Nationally, 50.8, more than half of Ghanaians are telling us that MP, your role is to what? Develop. You are advocate of development. That is the role of member of parliament. Last week, there was a program organized by the College Bishop Company. The first deputy speaker was telling us his experience of going to his constituents, whereby he met the people and discussed issues about parliament with them. They were not interested. They were interested in the school classroom when you are building it. One of the major concerns raised by constituents was that many MPs don't visit their constituencies. I'm told that you need a lot of money to be able to visit their constituencies. But the truth is, whether you like it or not, members of parliament, we are expect you in the constituency. Now, we have information in some electoral areas and some constituencies that since some members of parliament were voted for, they have not done what we call thank you tour. Going back to say thank you people for voting for me to serve you, some members of parliament are yet to do that. A member of the research team, Ketri Frimpon, said 49.5% of constituents across the country said they won't vote for their incumbent MPs in 2020. According to Ketri Frimpon, experienced lawmakers enjoy more support from constituents than first-time MPs in the legislature. It is the most garbage that people will think people say they should go, they should go, they should go, they should go. 30 or so Mugabe's, those who have spent four times or more, one ten of them, the people support them and they should go again. On the other hand, of the 121st term MPs, about 80, they have people say they should go again. Some members of parliament who were present during the presentation indicated that the research is a great source of feedback for them. Take for instance, that assuming my conscience is that they've not been seeing me, if you want to win again, what will you do? I will start going there. At least it tells you what your people think, whether uh, they are justified to think the way they think, uh, whether uh, they appreciate your work or not, uh, whether you have a difficulty that they don't know, whatever it is. According to the findings, Education Minister Dr. Matthew Pukuprempe is the best performing minister in President Ekufuado's administration. Without a doubt, 18 months is a long time in politics and a lot could happen within that period. 
and certainly no sitting member of parliament would want to dismiss the outcome of this research done by a team that accurately predicted the outcome of the 2016 general election. For TV3 News, my name is Kwachi Afreniyama. All right, so let's uh, go to Skype now and deal, we want to delve a bit um, deeper into this discussion and pick the thoughts of um, Dr. Rashid Draman. He's the Executive Director of the Africa Centre for Parliamentary Affairs. Um, good afternoon, sir, if you can hear me, and thank you for all your time. Good afternoon. Well, to start with, uh, the research shows that minority MPs are performing a lot better, or at least slightly better than those in a majority. What in your opinion, could be accounting for this? Well, I think uh, generally what we see across uh, many parliaments around the world is that uh, usually opposition MPs who are in line to wrestle power from the majority group uh, are most of the time active um, when compared to uh, the members of parliament from ruling parties. So I believe this might be what, what, uh, what, what has accounted for this. Sometimes complacency sets in, uh, in, in, in the case of um, MPs who are uh, from the ruling party, particularly in the, in the case of this our parliament where uh, the results of the 2016 elections um, gave the MPP uh, a very huge margin in terms of uh, the difference between the NDC and the MPP. So I think this might be what, what has accounted for this. And uh, looking at the sample size that was worked with, that's uh, some 27,000, over 27,000, and the percentage of persons that uh, we are told would not vote for their MPs, what is the correlation we can draw the numbers and then the percentage, do you think that um, it really would have any influence at all? Well, I think uh, even if we leave the numbers aside, let's look at history. I mean, this is this, uh, what, what we are hearing from this research, I think is confirmed by history um, in Ghana. It's also confirmed by what we know happens around the continent. In our country, over the years, I think averagely the, the attrition rate is, is around 50%. Of course, I mean, now we have uh, disaggregated kind of data which shows, uh, I think it's skewed more towards first-time MPs and so on. But I think averagely, we normally see around 50%. In some countries, it's higher. I mean, in Sierra Leone, the last elections, 80% did not come back. There was a time in Senegal, 95% did not come back. So I think what we are seeing in terms of the data um, is consistent with history, is consistent with, uh, with reality, both in our country and in, uh, in so, other so countries around the world. So what you're saying is there is the possibility that this could translate to reality come 2020, where majority of the uh, MPs on the, uh, the government side are likely to lose their seats? Well, I mean, I think uh, that, is, that, is, uh, that, that is a fact. I mean, not only the government side, I think uh, the opposition... The opposition itself should not be should not be smiling about this. I think uh, this is perception, but sometimes uh, it translates very much into reality. And then there could be some some uh, some some um, maybe if you like uh, uh, um, uh, outliers. I mean, some surprises. And uh, before we let you go, there has also been the concern of um, the time that this research has been conducted and when the reality sets in in 2020 and that the electorate themselves, one, are not properly educated on what the role of an MP is. And then also it's really quite about well, well, 18 months to go. There is a possibility when they start getting the T-shirts and the five Ghana CDs and, and the bags of rice, their minds could turn. Based on the research that you mentioned, does that play a role at all in the final decision? Well, I mean, that, that's going to play a role. I mean, uh, earlier on, I was talking to another group, and I was saying that, look, the reason why we see all these uh, kind of data that we are seeing about our um, MPs and our parliament is because of the structure of our economy. Until, until the, the structure of our economy changes, until people are able to meet their bread and butter issues, 
we are going to continue to see these kinds of uh, these kinds of things. Uh, look, IPU, the Interparliamentary Union, did a study around the world. I mean, a few years ago, and they found that look, 53 percent of citizens around the world think that the role of a member of parliament should be the role that he or she plays in the constituency. I mean, and that is, uh, you know, mainly skewed, particularly in African countries. If you go to the UK, in Canada, other places, citizens are not going to ask M an MP to build a hospital or to build a road. They know that's not his role. I mean, and then also have structures that are responsible for that, and they have a very good understanding. And then they don't follow an MP and say, give me money for school fees and so on. So until the structure of our economy changes, until our station in the process of development shifts from where we are right now, I think uh, we are going to be, I mean, have to be living with this for some time to come. We are grateful for your time as always, uh, Dr. Rashid Draman. Uh, he is the uh, director of the Africa Center for Parliamentary Affairs, uh, helping us try and put this into perspective. But let's come back to the, the, the studio and speak um, with uh, Dr. Isaac Owusu Mensa. He's a political science, um, political scientist, I should say, and then also um, was part of the team that undertook this research. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for your time. Yes, good to have you with us to um, you know delve deeper into this. First of all, members of parliament have already you know, downplayed this report and are saying that oh, you, even the sample size you used, you probably just spoke to very few people who would give you something more concrete. So this is nothing to write about. What is your reaction to that? Thank you very much. I think as a researcher, when research is conducted, you expect this type of responses. But I would say that any member of parliament that will downplay this research is doing uh, his digging his own grief, let me use the word this way. Because if you have not been to a community and we've told you that your community people are looking for you, then you have to go there. Mm -hmm. Let me just give an example. In 2016, I'm sure you recollect that we also did a, a, a study that MPP was going to beat NDC. And our difference was, our percentage was 9.20. The final result was 9.219. Mm. So, it was so, so at least your sample size and your final outcome is almost equal to the um, final the election results. And let me also tell for the p p consumption of the public and of course the members of parliament as well. These are quantitative figures that we have given out. Okay. We also have qualitative data from every constituency. We have a dossier as big as that for every constituency. Really? What they like about the MP, what they don't like about the MP, what the MP has done, who is the contender in that constituency in his, from his party, who is the contender from the, uh, the opposition party, and we have all that detail. So this is just the quantitative information that we have. Mm. If you want more information about detail about your constituency, we can give up. Thank but you if you don't play it, we don't have any problem. The university's objective is to produce knowledge. Okay. It's for industry to either use it or throw it away. That's actually my next question. What was the rationale behind this research? What were you seeking to achieve? But one of the main objectives we were seeking to achieve is to avoid the high attrition rate in our Parliament. Well, I'm happy uh, the Dramani to talked about it. It's not good for the country. Mm. If you want to build democracy, you must have institutions. If you go to some countries like Egypt, you have MP that has been there for 30 years. Some countries, 29 years. Some countries, uh, uh, 25 years. In Ghana, we cannot boast of that. We, so we do have a few, don't we? At least no, we have the, well, one the, the person, ones we've tagged the One person since 1992. Only two people since 1996. And it's not good for us as a country. Yeah, but Doc, you can also then... Uh, draw in this same conversation that these people, the fact that they've stayed longer in, uh, in Parliament, doesn't mean that they are doing what is expected of them. It, it, is that not part of the conversation? No, it's that part of the conversation. But the point of emphasis is that we don't want to switch whereby we have 50% attrition rate. Right. So we want the MPs to look back. This is a midterm. Look back. What am I doing right? What am I not doing well? What can I do to improve my lot? Mm. So that if we can do all this, at the end of the day, we are able to reduce the number of people who lose their seats. Mm. But last election, if you remember, some people were shocked at the primaries. And some people are shocked at the elections. We want to avoid all these things. Okay. That is why we did the research. There is also the concern about um, was the issue where the, 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 the electorate or the voters have no knowledge what the role of the MP is. Constitutionally, we know that members of parliament are supposed to be what, lawmakers. In fact, in the, in the local language, they call them mrashebeja, omomu shemra. So they are supposed to you know, make laws. How does the, the, the duty or the responsibility of an MP 
translate it to the expectation that the citizens or the voters have of them. Thank you very much. MP has three major roles. One is the one that is done in Parliament, whereby he's speaking on the floor of the House, committee level and all that. That is one. The next one is representation. MP going to TV station, radio station, going to ECOWAS Parliament, AU Parliament, Commonwealth Parliamentary Union, all that is also one. The next one is MPs work at the constituency. When you're talking about the fact that MPs' role is to make laws, these are British, these are British parliamentary democratic theories. Right. In Ghana, it doesn't happen that way. In Ghana, that's, we also tested that, and 50% told us that for MPs' major role is to advocate for development, 50%. And 88% also inform us that the MPs made promises during the campaign. Promises about what? No mm -hmm. promises about, I'll give you a husband or wife. Promises about the fact that you build your roads. Promise about the fact that we'll build schools, we'll build hospitals, we'll, we'll give employment. So if you've been voted for on, on that basis, then you must be held deliver. accountable on that basis. But are we failing, or are we not failing as a country to educate the people? Did your research also seek to educate people on what the role of the MP should be and that they should start holding them accountable on those bases, like the three key things you talked about? No, as a matter of fact, when somebody needs a school fees to go to school, and you go and explain to him, and my role as a member of parliament is to make law in parliament. Next time, they will not vote for you. Unfortunately, it's but the structure it? of our economy. The right. economy is not doing well as a, uh, as a country over the years. Mm -hmm. So if the structure of the economy depends that everybody should make a contribution, let me be very emphatic with you. They expect every stakeholder in the constituents to make a contribution. DCE, member of parliament, chief, even if you're an educated person from a village, they expect you to make a contribution to that. So every big person in the community has a contribution to make. So if we voted for you as a member of parliament and you want to come and tell us the stories or theories that uh, according to parliamentary democracy, I'm supposed to make laws, I'm supposed to check the ex executive best and all this. And these are theories. We are okay. not interested in that as a country. We okay. haven't reached there yet. The, the Speaker of Parliament has actually spoken about this, also asking a very similar question like whether or not you have sought to increase the education. I know the NCC is supposed to be doing that as well. The information we've gathered is that um, members of parliament are currently debating your research. And so we'll go briefly to the House of Parliament and pick the feed. Then, based on some of the things they'll say, we'll come and conclude their interview. Regional minister, deputy, and all the MMDCs um, also thought that most of the students go to write the morning section, and in the afternoon, how to survive becomes a problem. So government has actually decided that those in that enclave should be given one hot meal after the first paper, so at least they don't go home, they stay over to write. And I think this is a very laudable uh, uh, program, which we must all look I think, at. I think uh, we just missed that by a whisker, because uh, that debate actually just finished, or that discussion on the floor of parliament just finished. So then they're talking about the BEC and issues around, uh, surrounding it. We would also be delving into that while the bulletin goes on, but let's come in studio and conclude, um, or you know, finalize this conversation. So of the constituencies you visited, which ones stood out for you, and what were the major things that jumped out at you out of the research? First, one of the things that surprised me most is that Ghanaians, what they expect of the MP first is to visit them. Okay. And visitation took a lot of this. And if you look at which MPs are visiting, which, are, which regions are not visiting, and I was surprised to see that Greater Accra MPs are those that are not visiting their constituents so much. Really? Uh, yes, that was one of the shocking things. That uh, MPs in Greater Accra are those who are not visiting their constituents, constituents as compared to all the other regions in Ghana. One of, one of the surprises. Second surprise, if you find out about explanation of government policies, mm. you'll notice that the NDC MPs are explaining government policies much more than the MPP MPs. Right. Yes. And then maybe just for a teaser, we have more details we want to come. We also talk about the best performing. MPs. Okay. We have Asutisi South, Efutu, Abitifi, Atrima East, Elembele, North Tong, Adaklo, Achimo, uh, Suedro, North Dai, and the Ketu South. These are the best performers. The best performing I mean, MPs, according to their constituents, yeah, how they rank, rank them. Okay. Uh, TV3 certainly will be getting that dossier, and I will pick out some of the, uh, the notable uh, components of it, and then we'll make it available on our website, and then also we'll be discussing it further in our subsequent bulletins. But thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Isaac Ousumenta is a political science, political scientist, and then also uh, part of that research that rated and ranked MPs according to performance based on what their constituents are saying.
that's the still Midday Live on TV3. Let's turn our attention to our biggest story that we have for you this afternoon. And information reaching TV3 has suggested that uh, the arrest of a headmaster of a private school in Aflao for registering and allowing pupils from Togo to sit for the basic school certificate examinations may just be the tip of the iceberg. Exclusive information made available to the news team indicates that this is a business that has uh, been running for a while. The Togolese pupils, the news team learns, are pupils of purposely, who are purposely set schools running the Ghanaian syllabus in Togo. The owners of these schools in Togo charge these pupils, then in con uh, connivance with the headmaster or the head teachers of the school, get the pupils enrolled for the BEC examination portal, where then they get to sit to write the exam. My colleague, Sela Mamenya, um, has more on this development issue and has actually been following it keenly and would want to ask him and tease out some of the, the, the shocking details that we have been able to gather for you. Selam, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, um, Martin. Break it down simply to the viewer. What are we hearing of? That some people who are technically non ghanaians pupils, are writing the BEC in Ghana because some teachers, head teachers, have what registered them onto our system? Yes, so, so this is what it is, that uh, parents, some parents in Togo and Nigeria and the rest want their kids to enjoy that kind of training or education that we have here in Ghana. So private schools in Togo are actually in bed or are in Kahoot with some private schools in Aflau. Hmm. And what they are doing is to get in their students registered. They are actually teaching the curricula of Ghana or GES. So at the end of the day, they end up bringing these children into uh, Aflau to write the BEC exams. And beyond those 62 that we know, and that Faith Mission and Kekeli, we have 28 of these schools in Togo who are affiliated to eight schools uh, in Aflau. And what is happening is that our statistics show that each school presents about 35 pupils to sit the BEC annually. Every year? Every year. And the schools, this data I'm giving you is as of 2017. So it's possible that by now it would have the doubled. The numbers have increased. Yeah, or increased. So what it is is that the 35 by 28 plus, let's say 30, that gives us about 1,050 pupils annually. And these 1,050 people, at the end of the day, get smuggled into our system, mm -hmm. and then they sit for mm -hmm. this BC. And some of the schools are affiliated to as much as four of these uh, schools. Okay. And it is big business for them. And so the, we know that this was triggered, or this information is actually coming out ourselves after the a headmaster was arrested. Yeah. Do we know where exactly this arrest took part, uh, happened, and which school is this? How many people do we have an idea how many he had registered? Well, um, for what we know so far is that 62 Togolese students were registered. In that, that school? In that school. 62? That's, yes. That's uh, the Kekeli International uh, Preparatory. And these people, peoples are said to be or alleged to be from Faith International in Togo. Okay. And beyond this, we have other seven schools in Aplau who are in the same business. So it means as we speak, we know the BEC started yesterday yeah. and today is day two. So as we speak, these 62 are currently writing. They are Do currently we writing, but we, what we know is that the headmaster who was arrested is still in the custody of the police. Mm. But as to whether... Uh, the pupils have been stopped or they, they have been allowed to write, that we cannot confirm yet. Mm. And looking at how sh surprising this is, have we already heard anything from the Ghana Education Service? Have we had any hint of what they intend doing? Well, we, we worked at the lines and spoke to a few people in authority. Uh, they claim not to have much information, so mm. what they are doing is gathering information and then uh, I'm sure by 360, we'll have a lot of information to put out there. We have a lot of figures, a lot of data mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. will be uh, put in our subsequent. And you're telling us that um, this probably must have started in 2017. Or before, 2017 before 2017, the investigations were triggered by the fact that the, the, the then candidate, that is uh, Nana Kufado, was uh, championing or trumpeting that he was going to have free SHS. So the investigators decided 
to look at what this might mean because we have scenarios like where our fuel was was being subsidized it was being uh, smuggled and, and yeah, all yeah. of that so they decided to do this investigation and uh, this story that broke yesterday actually triggered that uh, thing wow all right uh, we are grateful for your time and uh, thank you very much uh, Salam Amenya is a, a colleague here in the in the, in the at TV3 and um, he's helping us you know, break down that news we have heard regarding the, the, the arrest of a headmaster that has, you know, unleashed all sorts of information regarding some Togolese pupils who have been registered in Ghana to write the BEC with the sole aim of entering our secondary universities, uh, secondary, uh, you know, schools because of the free senior high school that um, uh, the country is currently running. Let's go on to the Skype now and speak to Peter Pate Anti, he's a director of uh, executive director of the Institute for Education Studies. Uh, Mr. Anti, good afternoon and thank you for your time. Uh, does this come to you as a surprise in any way? Good afternoon. Yes, uh, it's it's quite interesting that um, we 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 are we are having such an information. Um, it means that a lot of the people on the, on the in the background, I, I mean the uh, district education offices in the in that particular area are not doing their work very well. And for the fact that I, I, what we are getting now is even just from 2017, do you glean in any way that it probably must have been ongoing for some years now? Yeah, there might be that possibility. But then let's let's look at this whole uh, incident in, 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 in respect of our education act. So of course, we know that education in Ghana is governed by the Act 778, which was passed in 2008. And, and it's clear in it that education is supposed to be provided by the Republic, the Republic of Ghana for the people in Ghana. And then the private sector is also giving the opportunity to provide education for to supplement what the, the government is doing. Now, how do we bring in the private sector? The, the act makes it possible that anybody who wants to start a private education system should have uh, an author authorized permission from the Ministry of Education and, of course, the Ghana Education Service and the Accreditation Board. Now, if these schools that we are talking about are operating in Togo, it means that totally they do not even qualify to, operate, to, to sit in for our basic uh, examination because it means they are not covered by the laws of Ghana there's no way that we are able to, we will be able to monitor them. There's no way that we can vouch for the quality of education that they are giving to the kids out there. So they do not qualify at all. Now, mm -hmm. in talking about affiliating schools in Togo to Ghana, I, I, I think there is a system in place that, that looks at affiliation. Normally, affiliation has to do with our tertiary institution. So if, if there is a, a, a a school in Togo that is affiliated to a school in Ghana, then it means that the the the, the Ghana Education Service, National Accreditation Board, the Ministry of Education should be aware, should, should be aware of this. If they are not aware, then it means that what they are doing is also an illegality because it's it's highly impossible for a private school in Ghana to say that they they have schools in Togo that is affiliated to to schools in Ghana. I think that is the only way that they are able to bring in their their walls to to write uh, the kids to write the exams. So. Yeah. We, the, 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 do we even have, I, I have always known, or the, the, the conversation has always been that affiliations has always been at the higher level, isn't it? From maybe a university I, level, a tertiary level. So exactly, since when is, did we have basic said. level um, it's, affiliations? It, it, it's unheard of. It's unheard of. It's unheard of. So I, 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 that's why I said that there, there's a level of neglect from the district education directly. That, the reason why I'm saying is this is this. You see, every year we know the number of students that progresses, and this is possible because circuit supervisors visit these schools. So they should know the number of students that are in each of all of these schools. Now, mm -hmm. if you are going to register these kids and you see that there is an astronomical increase in the number of candidates that are, are registering for the BC. It should trigger some kind of alert in anybody, in any official at the district level, and and questions should start. Should, we should start asking questions. Mm. How come that? How come that your your number of progression for GSS one, GSS two is around eighty, and you're you're, you're registering one eighty students? Right. That, that is a clear indication that there's something fishy going on there. Somewhere. So they neglected their work, and and that is where we are, where we are now. I think that. The authorities should step in and, and, and make sure and they end this. this as early as possible because 
we, we cannot continue. You, you know already the free SHS is, 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 is it's a, under its own stress, of, isn't it? Yes, and, okay. and, and you are bringing in foreigners to come and enjoy, and, and it, it, it's hmm. not appropriate. Right. Peter, we'd have to leave it here for now, but thank you very much, for, uh, as always, for making time to speak with us. Peter Pate Anti is the Executive thank Director you. for the Institute for Education Studies. Bottom line, something is going wrong somewhere. Would uh, dig deeper into this, speak to the authorities and uh, our correspondents in and around the country would uh, also give us an update on this. Stay with us, News 360 and our subsequent bulletins will bring you an update on this shocking and developing story. This is still Midday Live on TV3. Let's uh, do the MTN video report and our citizen journalist Julius Adadi highlights on the constant flooding on the main road leading to Community 25 in Tema and warn city authorities to ensure that the bridge um, on that stretch is widened. The main road leading to Community 25. This is the Bay Gata, which is overflowing, and the bridge is just small as this. So water cannot pass through the bridge. But if we were to have enough space under the bridge or the bigger space, all this water convey here have to overflow the road quickly goes through the bridge. Now look at the number of cars stuck over there. The water now bypasses another main. Look at how it's also making here. This is what we have here. This is just the small portion, the bridge, but the bigger portion of the water overflow the boundary. This is Julius Saturday reporting from Bejaku. So wherever you find yourself, if you do have any story to give us, you can send it to our MTN video uh, report WhatsApp number, which is 055-143-0044. 055-143-0044. And we'll be happy to share with the rest of the world. This is still uh, Midday Live on TV3. We are taking a quick breather. When we return, we'll give you the latest in the world of business. Thank you very much for staying with us. Time for business now. And World Bank Country Director Henry Karali has warned that Ghana is at a risk of high debt distress unless sustainable measures are taken to improve domestic revenue collection. An IMF fiscal monitor report released in April projected debt to GDP to hit 62% by the end of 2019. Henry Karali was speaking at a media encounter in Accra. Ghana's total debt stock expressed as a percentage of its gross domestic product, GDP, has fluctuated on a high mark for years. Debt to GDP stood at 73.1% in 2016, 70.5% in 2017, and 58% in 2018. The latest IMF fiscal monitor report projects Ghana's debt to GDP will hit 62% by end 2019. Country director of the World Bank, Henry Corrali, says Ghana is at risk. The debt sustainability analysis that is done by the World Bank and the IMF uh, does look into this as a key uh, indicator of debt distress. That analysis indicates that Ghana is at, is at risk of high debt distress, primarily because of uh, the revenue side, uh, the domestic revenue being uh, pretty weak. He explains, activities in the informal sector are significant and need to be captured within the tax net. The level of, of debt is, is a concern. Um, the debt dynamics uh, is, is a concern because uh, Ghana remains at a high risk of debt distress. The revenues to debt service is low and because the exports to debt service is low. And so what we expect to see uh, the government doing over time is to improve the revenue position. He bemoaned the low collection rate of property tax, which he says has a high potential and urged government to broaden the narrow economic base by shifting focus from extractives. In other business news this afternoon, Director of Capital Markets at investment firm First Bank, Winslow Saki, has raised concerns about the rate of depreciation of the city, which is currently at 7%, increasing by 2% over the last two weeks. He says that the debt stock capital outflows amongst others must be checked if the rate of depreciation will stabilize or reduce.
Yes, uh, the currency, it, it appears that uh, the currency is slipping a bit. Mm. Uh, a few weeks back, we were doing 5.12. Uh, depreciation of the CD was around 5%. Now we are looking at 7.77. And looks my, like it might get worse because uh, there's one, the effect of uh, a high debt stock. Mm -hmm. So we have to change more dollars to make interest payments. And then there's also dividend repatriation. You know, we are in the season where companies are declaring dividend and then their foreign subsidiaries will definitely repatriate those dividends. Sure. And then the other effect is the warnings that we've had from UK and Canada about terror attacks in Ghana. So there's a bit of fear amongst the foreign investors here. But I don't think that would impact us so significantly, even though there will be a transient effect on the city. So that's it for business on Midday Live. There is more news on our website, 3 newscom where we would also be happy if you can get interactive with us and uh, we'll send the rest of the information you're you know, you sending to us to the rest of the world by sharing it and getting your thoughts on that as well. Now, there's another disturbing story that we are monitoring for you. It has to do with the back-to-back -back warnings of foreigners who are coming into the country. So it started with the, uh, the abduction of the two Canadian girls and then the Canadian embassy issued a warning to its citizens. Then the UK government issued a similar warning. The latest to join the countries that are warning their citizens is Australia. The Australian government has issued a warning to its citizens to be wary of what it describes as the deplorable security situation in the northern parts of the country, cautioning its citizens. First Assistant Foreign Affairs and Trade Secretary HK Liu um, and the High Commissioner to Ghana, Andrew Barnes, announced a 75,000 Australian dollar support to train and enable Ghana security services, offer security and safety uh, to Australian mining companies in the country and the sub-region. Australian mining companies have enormous interest and already a huge amount of investment in West Africa. And we don't want that to be under any threat, especially by terrorism or security issues. So the conference has been organised to make sure that we have all, we actually share all the intelligence and information that we have on hand uh, about how we can keep ourselves safer and how we can actually assist host countries to also deal with these um, issues that are emerging. And so to that extent, I'm extremely pleased to be able to announce today that Australian government will be contributing 75,000 Australian dollars towards a interagency counter-terrorism course to be run by the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Centre. Uh, we believe uh, that one of the key things that needs to be done around issues like this, and certainly Australia has some experience in dealing with this in our region as well, is to ensure that there is clear communication and clear information sharing channels, especially amongst different agencies. All right, so we're staying on this subject matter. Emmanuel Kuting is a security analyst, and I would want to pick his thoughts on this back-to-back -back warnings. Should we, we be worried as a country? Mr. Kuting, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. It is becoming one too many, these warnings. Are they justified, if I should ask, and then also as Ghanaians and our government for that matter? Should they be worried? Well, thank you for having me, and very good afternoon to your cherished viewers. Yes, whether we should be worried or otherwise, it will depend on the context. One, you realize that uh, many of these embassies are duty-bound to give their nationals these updates for the fact that insurers in, the, in their respective country normally want to know what uh, security situations are in these uh, respective countries. And you realize that in Ghana, we don't pay more attention to uh, life and property insurance. So in most of these cases, if the embassies fail to update their citizens about the happenings in their respective jurisdictions, more often than not, they are complicit in insurance claim. But they must do it within the context of the law. You will agree with me that it has taken Ghana many years and if you like decades, to build a niche as the safest country in Africa. 
So I've heard a lot of debate this morning about citizens not happy and comparing the rate of crime in this country to Ghana. Mm. I think mm. that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is not doing its work. Mm. If these uh, alerts are coming and they go on challenge, it means that these embassies have done it in consultation with the relevant agencies or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Mm. Otherwise, I think it is proper that the, minist uh, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs do the honorable thing by inviting these uh, embassies to come and provide a fair evidence to mm. the fact that they are giving... But, but my final question to you regarding that, Mr. Kuting, would be, do they need empirical evidence to, to, to give these, uh, these alerts? Look what happens sometimes in the northern part of the country. And this particular warning mentioned the northern part of the country. Other ones have mentioned the fact that, you know, insecurity could occur, kidnapping could occur. These are things that are happening. So what empirical evidence do they have to have before they warn their citizens? You see, these embassies don't exist as an island. They have to do this alert or warning in consultation with our relevant security agencies. Because you, you can never imagine the negative effects this is bringing to the country. And I just listened to... Uh, a financial consultant which was talking about the negative effect it's even having on our cities, people who are trying to come to Ghana by way of terrorism or um, tourism or business and other things will be thinking otherwise. So right. there's nothing wrong with such uh, uh, warnings, but it must be done within the context of the oh, law oh, and oh. conjecture okay. to paint the country black as if there is so much crime in Ghana. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kuting, as always, for your time. Emmanuel Kuting is a security analyst helping us there. That's it for the bulletin. It came your way from our studio here at Adesanwe in Accra. My name is Martin Esiedu Dati. Thank you very much for watching. There is more news on our website, freenews.com. Do have a good afternoon, as always. Stay positive. Bye.